What's up, folks? Uh, this is Shane Nelson coming to you live on YouTube. It is currently 1.20 in the morning. And I am on here to talk about the Sabbath and answer any questions that anybody has about the Sabbath. The Sabbath day is the day that Yahuwah ceased his work of creation and set it apart we can go to Genesis chapter 2 verse 2 it says and in the seventh day Elohim completed his work which he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had made and Elohim blessed the seventh day and set it apart because on it he rested from all of his work which Elohim in creating had made so we can see very clearly that God himself has set apart and sanctified the seventh day of his creation as a time of rest it's not saying that God needed rest necessarily but that um, he chose to set that day apart now we can fast forward to Exodus chapter 20 verse 8 through 11 God is speaking to the children of Israel right now this is not written on stone tablets but he says remember the Sabbath day and set it apart six days you shall labor and do all of your work but the seventh is a Sabbath day of Yahuwah, your Elohim. You do not do any work. Not you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, or the stranger that is within your gates. For in six days Yahuwah made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore Yahuwah blessed the Sabbath day, and sanctified it there's a joke in there <clears throat> it mentions the people that cannot work your son your daughter your manservant your ma maidservant your cattle or the stranger that is within your gates but it never mentions the wife which I think is kind of humorous actually and uh, for anybody out there that actually does keep the Sabbath you will know that wives they don't really get a sabbath i mean when you got diapers to change you got to change them diapers and if you don't change them well the baby will get a rash you know kids are screaming they're hungry they want this they want that and mom's you know chasing kids around so it only makes sense that god knowing that okay the wife's not really going to get the sabbath break let's go ahead and just leave her out of the equation that way you know poor mama doesn't get stoned for changing a diaper but anyway that's taking things to the extreme um, but I also want to point out that the Sabbath is eternal it is an everlasting covenant between God and the children of Israel <clears throat> now some people might say well that's for Israel that's not true because in numbers chapter 15 verses 15 through 16 it says there is one law for the assembly and for the stranger who sojourns with you a law forever throughout your generations as you are so shall the stranger be before Yahuwah there is one Torah and one right ruling for you and for the stranger who is sojourning with you so when we as believers congregate and we say that Yeshua HaMashiach is our Messiah which is Jesus Christ when we say that the Jewish King is our King we become sojourners with Israel now a lot of the Jews today they don't believe that uh, Yeshua is the Messiah well that's fine there's a ton of Jews that do and even more Jews that believe in Messiah secretly but it still doesn't negate the fact that even before the Jews or the Israelites were even a people 
they still knew about the Sabbath. We see in uh, Exodus uh, 16 that Moses told the children of Israel before God even gave the Ten Commandments to rem to to, he said, tomorrow is the Sabbath of rest. Get, gather the manna that you're going to get today. Store up uh, twice as much as you would normally get. Because tomorrow there's not going to be any uh, there's not going to be any manna outside. So the, the Sabbath was already there. And plus in Exodus 28-11, uh, through 11, he actually says, remember the Sabbath. So it was something that I think was already being done. It was already known. Um... But now that we've established that even in the Torah, God commands that the strangers that are sojourning with Israel uh, should keep the Sabbath. Uh, well, I'd also like to point out that Yeshua says salvation is of the Jews. And uh, everything starts with the house of Israel and then pours over into the Gentiles. So it's not like we get to make up our own rules with this sort of thing so um, now there's another scripture in Isaiah where God commemorates uh, non-Hebrews for keeping his Sabbath and we can go ahead and just read that right fast it's Isaiah uh, 56 verse 1 says thus saith Yahuwah guard right ruling and do righteousness for near is my deliverance to come and my righteousness is to be revealed blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who becomes strong in it guarding the sabbath lest he profane it and guarding his hand from doing any evil and let not the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to yahuwah speak saying yahuwah has certainly separated me from his people nor let the eunuch say, Look, I am a dry tree. For thus saith Yahuwah to the eunuchs who guard my Sabbaths and have chosen what pleases me. Pause. So we can see that choosing the Sabbath is what pleases Yahuwah. Let's continue. And are holding on to my covenant. To them shall I give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of the sons and daughters. I give them an everlasting name that is not to be cut off. Also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to Yahuwah to serve him and to love the name of Yahuwah to be his servants. All who guard the Sabbath and not profane it and are holding on to my covenant. Right here we see Yahuwah is commemorating the foreigners who keep the Sabbath. He likes it. And there's only like three things in this life that we need to figure out. That's who God is, find out what he wants, and do what he says. That's pretty much the whole, the whole reason for existence. <clears throat> Let me head on over here and see if there's any questions in the live chat. And we don't have any questions. I will continue. Yeshua said something very interesting in Matthew 24 concerning what many believe to be end time prophecy and uh, the, the destruction of the world etc but I will quote something actually I'm just going to go ahead and read it I'll start in verse 16 Matthew 24 16 then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains let him who is on the housetop not come down to take whatever is out of his house and let him who is in the field not turn back to get his garment and woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing children in those days and pray that your flight does not take place in winter or on the Sabbath for then there shall be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time no nor ever shall be so you can see right here a command from the master himself saying that we should pray that our flight does not take place in winter or on the sabbath day you can almost gather from that that yeshua expected everyone to be keeping the sabbath all the way up until his return so why does everybody profane the Sabbath? It beats me. 
we've got so so many things in the scriptures here uh, well maybe if people stopped going to church and listening to every word that their pastor says thinking God himself was speaking we might actually you know get somewhere but um, the the Sabbath is a very vital part of God's covenant and and he gets very sore when you take things like that away from him you can see that the Jews were actually kicked out of the land entirely in uh, 586 BC when the temple was destroyed for the sole purpose that they did not give the land a Sabbath something as simple as not giving the land a Sabbath they didn't give the land a Sabbath for um, I think it was 400 something years if I remember correctly because they went into exile for 70 years which was how many uh, years that the land didn't get its sabbatical rest so they didn't let the land rest for 490 years and so we can just go ahead and continue I'd like to point out that it was actually Constantine in uh, 330 AD that started the whole Sol Invictus Mithra day now they try to say well it's because Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday that's why we changed it to Sunday now and we just did away with Saturday well that's not a very good excuse according to God's Word they'll even go into certain uh, renewed covenant writings like Corinthians and then say see that the they were gathered together on the first day and they broke bread it's like okay maybe that's because they were all doing the Sabbath the, the day before and they didn't want to leave or do anything and then on the first day of the week they decided to come together and uh, break bread but that's actually that's actually a bad argument even for me because I know how to look at the actual Greek and I can see that it, it's not worded like that it actually in that sentence and let me just look up the, the scripture it's the word sabaton sabaton in the Greek means Sabbath and uh, I'll even give you the Greek Strong's concordance number So Acts chapter 20 verse 7 and 1 Corinthians 16 2. Let's start with Acts chapter 20 verse 7. And upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them ready to depart on the morrow and continued his speech until midnight. Now, if you can get eSword, it's a free download. You can get eSword. It's at uh, e-sword.com. You can download um, all sorts of Bibles, and it's a great tool. You can actually look at each Greek word that is used in this verse and see what the translators are hiding here. Because when you get to this word weak, it's not weak. It's Sabaton, and it comes from uh, Hebrew Strong's Concordance number H7676. So the Sabbath, that is, of the day or the weekly repose of secular avocations. So now you can also translate this as weak, and you can make that argument too, that sometimes in the Torah or in the Hebrew Sabbath could be translated as weak depending on context and they claim that it carries over that same way into the Greek now if you really want to break it down and look at it you can see that it was upon the first of the Sabbath which would be at sunset Friday night and Paul preached until midnight which is actually what I believe. I'm giving you all the arguments here. So, I mean, we just, if we can read this instead of week and put Sabbath, and upon the first of the Sabbath, when the disciples came together to break bread, 
Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and he continued his speech until midnight. Kind of makes sense to me. Um, other people can look at this and say it was a Havdalah service, which is at the end of the uh, of the Sabbath, going into the first day of the week, so Saturday going into Sunday. But it would it would be good for you guys just to to look for yourself and make up your own mind. But regardless of all these arguments that I just put together, this does not change the Ten Commandments. This does not change the Sabbath. This does not change the fact that in the future, according to Isaiah chapter 66, all of creation and everything that has flesh is going to worship the Father every new moon and every Sabbath day. And that is a future prophecy. Most people actually don't even know when the new moon is, sad to say. But I'd feel better if I actually just quoted you the exact scripture. Isaiah 66, <clears throat> 22 through 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall stand before me, saith Yahuwah, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another all flesh shall come to worship before me saith Yahuwah so if the Sabbath and the new moon celebration is so important to God that all flesh will worship him on these days in the future why the heck aren't we doing it now I think we've we've been too long in the pagan sun worship honestly Folks, if you got any questions, or if you feel that you need to rebuttal me in any way, there's a live chat box. You can post your comments at the, at the bottom here, and I will address them. So, uh, which is, this is kind of common knowledge, but Constantine, um, founder of the Catholic Church in the, in uh, around 330 AD, around that time frame, his empire was pretty much falling apart. Uh, their, their Christians, which at the time were known as Netzarim, they were keeping the Sabbath. They were keeping feast days. They were, they were very different than today's Christianity, I can tell you that. And they were not Catholic. Um, Constantine put the sword to the throat of all the Messianic believers and said, You will no longer keep the Sabbath. You will no longer keep the feast of the Jews. You're going to keep so you're going to keep Saturnalia. You're going to keep Ishtar. You're going to keep uh, the venerable day of the sun. And let me translate that for you. That means Christmas, Easter, and Sunday. And then he told the Catholics, or not, I'm sorry, not the Catholics. He told the pagans that we're going to change the we're going to change things around <clears throat> with y'all's the way you worship. We're going to change the Queen of Heaven to Mary. We're going to change all these demons and fallen angels that we worship as gods. We're going to change those to saints. And we're going to keep all of the, the sun worship traditions. And we're just going to create a big giant cesspool of mixed pagan worship. And we're all going to come together and we're going to be a big happy family. And there won't be any more uh, fighting amongst pagans and Christians. And we're going to unify my empire under one religion and if anybody goes against this religion you get fed to the lions or put in a dungeon or whatever which is pretty much what happened from that point forward all throughout the dark ages and even just about up until about the protestant reformation which was about 400 years ago the the, the netzarim were hunted down and killed people who were going to keep the sabbath people who held fat held fast to the commandments of the father they were the ones being hunted killed burned at the stake and there's actually evidence of that all the way up until about the 13th century of 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 the word uh, netzarim popping up in some of these these writings like the the so-called early church fathers they have some stuff on that too but i can't remember i can't quote i think Lou White has a book um, 
fossilized customs and he mentions some writing in the 13th century that mentioned these particular group of messianic believers that still kept that horrible sabbath and those horrible jewish feast days and you know they called them 14thers as a derogatory term because uh for the reason they would call them 14thers is because they kept the passover on the 14th day of the first hebrew month so they they coined them 14thers i don't know um usually history is written by the victor and you can see all throughout history especially when the so-called early church fathers hit the scene that the messianic movement torah observance sabbath observance was immediately squelched and taken over by a paganistic ideology of what i believe to be mainly just a bunch of pagans that adopted this idea of a messiah <laughs> And so we have people like um, Clement of Alexandria who chopped his own weenie off because of something that Yeshua said in the Renewed Covenant writings about uh, if a part of your body offends you, cut it off. It's better, you know, he, he whacked himself off. So, and this is an early church father. And, and he had a big influence in, in how the Catholic Church, like, got started and everything it's weird before 330 AD of Constantine Catholicism was a a philosophy it was an idea that many philosophers had that if everybody could just mix their religions together under one banner then all of the bloodshed would stop and everybody would get along that was the idea unfortunately uh that would mean that you would have to compromise on your belief of what you hold to be true and holy. So if you're going to compromise to to achieve some bigger, greater goal, which is a, a satanic doctrine, basically, so, um, you know, you'll be destroyed if you're going to do that, which is what we saw happen to Israel time and time again. Um, Israel, especially the northern tribes of Israel, would accept a uh, some mixed form of pagan worship and try to incorporate that into the worship of the true God, which God finds that detestable and, and an abomination according to his own Torah. He, he specifically says, do not go and inquire of the nations saying, how did you serve your gods so that we might learn to do it too? Okay. Um, you don't go out and learn the ways that the pagans worship their gods and then try to adopt and candy coat their garbage and candy coat it Christians say, I'm doing this for, for God now. God will reject that. No different than he rejects an offering made by fire that has a blemish or that there's something wrong with his genitalia. Or if he is lame or blind or just some sort of mutation with this poor animal, he's not going to accept that as an offering. He's not going to accept Christmas as anything. It, you know, if you want to get down to the nitty gritty with the first day of that week when Yeshua rose from the dead, it was a biblical holiday. It was first fruits. Leviticus 23. Look it up. It was first fruits. Because he was the first fruits of the resurrection, he was the first of creation, and he was the firstborn of many brothers. So, um, this is pretty, uh, pretty basic stuff. Yeshua was dead for three days and three nights, according to scripture. Now, on that particular year, Passover fell on a Wednesday, and he, uh, was he died at around three o'clock in the afternoon now the next day was a high sabbath uh, it even says that in john it doesn't say that in the other gospels but it does say in john that uh, the reason they they wanted to break the uh, their legs when they were on the cross was so that they would suffocate to death because according to the Torah, God's law, you cannot leave a 
body hanging on a tree on the Sabbath because it will pollute the land, according to uh, what Yahuwah says. So the Pharisees told the Romans, kill them, get them off the cross, it's almost the Sabbath. Now, they're not talking about the weekly Sabbath, they're talking about the high Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So we can go to Leviticus chapter 23 for those of you that don't know what the high Sabbath is of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and go to Leviticus 23 verse verse 15 no I'm sorry not verse 15 okay here it is verse 7 on the 15th day of the new moon is the festival of matzot, which is uh, unleavened bread. Seven days you eat unleavened bread. On the first day, you have a set-apart gathering. You do no servile work. And you shall bring an offering made by fire to Yahuwah for seven days. And on the seventh day is a set-apart gathering. You do no work. So you see that these are rest days. They're Sabbath days. And I will show you in the Gospel of John that even he mentions that it was a high day. John 19, verse 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Why is all this important? Because Christians, <clears throat> I don't know how you get three days and three nights from Good Friday to Easter Sunday, but it just don't work. You cannot cram three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday. So there is a problem there. Yeshua himself said that the only sign that the Jews would receive was the sign of Jonah that he was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights and he would be in the earth for three days and three nights and he was now you've got you have Wednesday night he's buried Thursday Thursday night Friday Friday night Saturday and as the day began to dawn which in the Hebrew means is a way of saying as the new day began to dawn not as in the Sun is coming up because we know according to scripture that in Hebrew in the Hebrew culture the Sun the day starts at sunset so on Saturday day 6 as the Sun was going down that the sixth the sixth day or I'm sorry the the uh, the third day of his burial was complete and as the day dawned into the first day of the week which is sunset on Saturday going into the first day of the week he was resurrected from the dead and um, <clears throat> that's how you can figure out you know how that works so I mean if Christians really want to do church at the right time I guess it would be Saturday at sunset and once again I see there's seven people watching. No questions or comments yet. Well, I'm kind of running out of things to say. But uh, you can, uh, I mean, there's so much stuff in the scripture about the sab Sabbath. It kind of leaves people with no excuse as to why people aren't keeping it. Now, you know, there's always the argument of... Um, in Colossians, this is what the, most Christians will say when you when you call their BS on you know not keeping the Sabbath. They say, "Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or in a new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come." Right. I mean, let's take a look at what it says in the scriptures. The, uh, when I say the scriptures, I mean uh, the, the TS 2009 from South Africa, the scriptures. It's a, it's a Messianic Bible. <clears throat> it 
says, Let no one therefore judge you in eating or drinking or in respect of a feast day or a new moon or a Sabbath. So it basically says the same thing. Now here's what, here's how you're going to mess this whole thing up <clears throat> if you're a Christian. <clears throat> First thing you have to understand is that Paul is not talking to you. Paul is talking to the Colossians. Now Colossia was a city, it was a pagan city, and it had a huge pagan temple. And all most of the people in the city worshipped some deity at this pagan temple and it was a big pagan fest and you've got this little group little group of people who follow Messiah and are trying to keep the commandments in the middle of this city now I'm sure that in this city just like it was with many ancient cultures that if you go to kill an animal to eat it you had better take that animal to the pagan temple first and dedicate it to the pagan god then you kill it and eat it I mean that's kind of how it worked even in Israel with the Creator's temple God's real temple if the place was too far for you according to scripture God says you can kill and eat in your town you don't have to take it to the temple but you know it that's only if it's too far for you if you're close enough to the temple and you have an animal that you want to kill and eat you best take it to the temple and have it killed kosher put the fat on the altar and it, it, and if you're in a giving mood uh, you can give a portion to the priest and then you know they they give you back your portion that you're going to eat so with these believers living in this pagan land of Colossia they are being judged by pagans for something attributed to eating which we're still not clear about they're being judged by them for drinking maybe maybe the pagans said you're not allowed to drink alcohol I don't know and they were especially judging them with respect of the biblical festivals the new moon and the Sabbaths which are all biblical so now that I'm looking at it in some context of geography who is living there what the culture is of the day who I mean how big was this assembly anyways in a pagan city surrounded by pagans with with any meat is could be just if you want to go buy meat in the town square it was probably killed in some God's name which means you can't eat it you know and then when you go up to uh, a market man that's selling meat and you say excuse me was this meat sacrificed to the the pagan god over there and they say yes it was I say okay well no thank you I can't eat that oh, how dare you how dare you reject the the meat sacrificed to our god you know I, I'm sure some weird stuff like that happened it happens to me okay I keep Torah when I go to a house or let's say I go to a Christian's house or something anybody's house they say here here's some pepperoni pizza so I'm sorry I can't eat that why not because it's got pork on it and they're like we'll just take the pork off it's like I'm not gonna do that and they're like why not I said well how would you like it if I gave you a piece of pizza with that had dead cockroaches cooked into the cheese and I told you to just take the cockroaches off of your pizza and eat it would you eat it no you would not eat it and I'm not going to eat a pig because it's against God's commandments. That's that's not what I do. And you know, you can quote Paul all day, but I know exactly what Paul was talking about. He was talking about basically veganism, ultra-holy veganism versus meat eaters. Ultra-holy people that said drinking alcohol was a sin versus people who didn't think drinking alcohol was a sin. Then you get into matters of of outright biasy in translation when they use words like bramada as food when it should be meat okay and uh, you know we can get into I can dissect every single so-called clean versus unclean doctrine that Christians use in the renewed covenant writings and I can turn it right around and say that's not what he's saying they say all things, all, all what is it in First Timothy that all things were um, 
you know, created for for Thanksgiving or something like that. I'm sure somebody watching knows the scripture I'm talking about. Maybe if somebody can post that, I can talk about that. But more importantly, back to Colossians 2.16, you can clearly see that the, the Messianic believers surrounded by the pagans were being judged by the pagans for doing biblical things, which probably went against the cultural norm of that geographical area. <clears throat> so when somebody quotes this scripture to me saying that they have the right to keep pagan holidays or they have the right to surpass <clears throat> to surpass the Sabbath and create any day of the week as their Sabbath, it, it's utter ludicrousy to me. Actually, <clears throat> it would probably be a better it would have probably worked out much better and probably removed a lot of confusion if Paul would have said, instead of let no man judge you, is let no pagan judge you in regards to meat, drink, or a biblical festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. I mean, how can you judge a person if they're not even doing those things? Most people don't even know when the new moon celebration is, and just for anyone watching right now it's tomorrow the new moon is tomorrow it's it's a it's a special day that you know we're supposed to in some way shape or form seek yahuwah according to numbers 10 10 we're supposed to blow the shofar which is a large animal horn and um you know there if there was a temple standing there would be certain uh, oblations um sacrificed on this day as well Family unto the Lord, ready to escape. Thank you, brother. Okay, well, thank you, whoever you are. Ready to escape. I've been, I've been thinking about that. We should all be praying that we should be able to escape the things that are to come. So there's some crazy things happening in the world right now, and they're only getting worse. <clears throat> there's some bad things going on in Nigeria right now. There is a, uh, a group of people, uh, I can't really pronounce the name of this group of people, but they consider themselves to be descendants of Jews. Most of them basically practice Judaism, and they are basically being killed murdered by the Nigerian uh, military and tortured and everything else is just horrible and almost nobody's even heard anything about it you know and it's been going on for a while now I'll keep those people in prayer too it's a bad deal going on over there <clears throat> so anyway we see also that Paul uh, in Colossians 2 17 says that these are shadow pictures of things to come or more more importantly these are prophetic shadow pictures of good things to come uh, so why wouldn't you want to be a partaker of the shadows of good things to come you know is it just complacency is it laziness is it the fact that we we worship ourselves more than we want to worship God Whatever is pleasing to us becomes more important than what is pleasing to the Father. That is the mindset of most Christians today. Most pastors too. I'm an uh, ordained minister through Netzarim Way Theological Seminary in Austin, Texas. And the reason, uh, and this is a Messianic uh, Torah observant school that I went to. And uh, I uh, took many classes and tests and things for four years and um, one of my assignments which was a very bizarre one but I did it anyway was to go to a church and ask the pastors and the elders two questions what is the great falling away and how many of the Ten Commandments can they do they know off the top of their head how many of the Ten Commandments do they know 
the first question yielded so many different answers I can't even remember them all nobody was nobody was in um, agreement I guess and when I went to the pastors and the leaders of the church and asked them the very simple question of what are the Ten Commandments they couldn't answer me in fact most of them got them wrong they said love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your I said no 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 that's not in the Ten Commandments that's not in the Ten Commandments oh well that's the most important one so I'm just sticking with that no it <laughs> Yeshua said, on these two commandments, hang all the other commandments. It doesn't mean they supersede all the, they, they do away with them. It doesn't mean that you forget about all the commandments and just focus on that. But they, the entire Torah does hang on those two commandments. If you love God, you're automatically going to want to do what he says. That's the first thing. If you love your neighbor then by nature you're automatically going to do the things that the Torah says you have you need to do such as if your neighbor uh, loses his property and you find it according to the Torah you are supposed to return that property to your neighbor if it don't matter if it's a ring a watch a goat a sheep a horse uh, anything if you truly love your neighbor you will return their property now you know there's people that don't do that they secretly keep their property if you if you love your neighbor you won't stand idly by while human life is in danger that's a commandment in the Torah do not stand by while human life is in danger now that's a no-brainer for some people because genuinely inside of all of us especially if you're a believer in Messiah you have uh, a love inside of you for people even if it's a person that is detestable to you if they're slipping away and they're about to die you're gonna extend a hand to save them doesn't matter what type of lifestyle they live or what it's just built into us to have mercy on people so that doesn't mean you don't still need to learn how to worship God because God has stated emphatically how he does and does not wish to be worshipped. We've got too many people these days that say, I'm going to worship God my own way. And, and that's no different than <clears throat> adding commandments to the Torah, which is forbidden. Deuteronomy 4.2, do not add to the word which Yahuwah gives you, nor take away from it. People say that, that the Messiah came and did away with all these laws. If he did that, then he just broke the law. <laughs> and he's a not, not the Messiah. So, no, he did not do away with the laws. Romans 3.31 says, uh, um, well, I don't want to misquote it. We can go straight to it. I'm good with memorizing numbers. I'm good at paraphrasing scripture, but not necessarily quoting it verbatim every time. Paul says, Do we then nullify the Torah by belief? Let it not be. On the contrary, we establish the Torah. So by our faith, we establish the Torah. Establishing the Torah does not mean we're trying to work, to work doing laws and commandments to be saved. That's what Pharisees teach. That's what most of the book of Galatians is about. When you read in context with Acts 15 and what the Pharisees were doing, they were saying, unless you're circumcised and you keep all the Torah, you're not saved. I'm like, well, wait a minute now. Then why did Yeshua die? I thought it was his death and his blood that was shed and his resurrection power that saves us. The Torah only condemns it shows you your sin it's a teacher a steward it's a a tutor hey it's the mirror james says it's it's the mirror you look into the perfect law you see you see what's in that perfect law and you see a sinner staring back at you 
which is you and me. So when Yeshua comes, he does, away, he does away with the curse of the law. The curse of the law is Deuteronomy 28 and Deuteronomy 29. The curse of the law is not keeping the Sabbath. As a matter of fact, it's a great blessing to keep the Sabbath. It's a blessing for me. I keep, I've been keeping the Sabbath for nearly 10 years now. I've been keeping Torah for 10 years and I have not found a single thing in the Torah that is considered a burden to me, especially the Sabbath. I don't allow the Sabbath to be a burden to me. Yeshua is master of the Sabbath. And besides, God created the Sabbath for man, not man for the Sabbath. There, there are people that take this day and turn it into something that it was never meant to be in the first place. They actually sell sh uh, kosher Shabbos toilet paper because Jews say if you tear anything on the Sabbath you're sinning <laughs> I was like what where does it say that in scripture well you're not allowed to tear anything so they got the special you can look it up Shabbos toilet paper I, th I think it's pretty expensive and it's a special toilet paper blessed by a rabbi or something that you know doesn't tear on the Sabbath and you're supposed to use that on the Sabbath to wipe your butt uh, give me a break okay it, it's it's the Sabbath <laughs> okay um, God says don't kindle a fire on the Sabbath that's why Jews don't walk I mean that that's why Jews don't drive to the synagogue they walk because they think starting a car is is going to make a fire in the engine with the combustion and they're breaking the Torah somehow by doing that. I don't believe that. Kindling a fire involves a lot of hard work and rubbing sticks together and sweating and there's not much rest involved in that. Why would you need to make a fire on the Sabbath anyway? Unless you were like lost in the woods with your family and it was going to be freezing and you were all going to die unless you made a fire. Now I could see how that would be permissible. You know, but there's Pharisees that would rather just go ahead and die with their whole family in the forest before they make a fire on the Sabbath. That's because they regard the day instead of the, gay, the day regarding them. The day is about us. It's not us about the day. First Timothy, okay, thank you, sir. First Timothy four four. Uh, I'll I'll address that. Let's take a look. Because every creature of Elohim is good, and none is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Thank you for pointing out that scripture. And now we're gonna have to look at it, the verses before it to get the context. It says. Um, it says, well, actually, let's just start at verse 1. It says, but the Spirit distinctly says that in the latter times, some shall fall away from belief, paying attention to misleading spirits and teachings of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having been branded of their own conscience, forbidding to marry, saying to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving. Okay, now, did a cockroach get created by God to be received with thanksgiving? No. Did God create a dog or a cat or a bat or a lizard to be taken with thanksgiving or to be received with thanksgiving? No. He created goats, sheep, chickens, turkey... Um, those types of animals were created to be taken with thanksgiving especially the sacrificial ones bulls, goats rams, pigeons turtle doves um, the sacrificial animals these are things that were created to be taken with thanksgiving worms were not created to be taken with thanksgiving so when I read all of this in context I don't see it as I have the right to eat a bowl of centipedes for breakfast in the morning. Because according to the scripture, Levit Leviticus chapter 11, uh, that is a, uh, 
it is an abomination to us. Now, it, God doesn't say it is an abomination to him for us to, if we were going to eat like a pig or something. He says it's an abomination to us. Now, abomination in the Hebrew means, in that context, it's going to make you sick. If you eat enough pigs, you're going to get sick. You're going to get high blood pressure. It's a very salty meat full of toxins and parasites. And it doesn't matter how much you clean that meat or, or how domesticated you think that animal is. It's still full of toxins. And God only wants what is healthy for your body. And not to mention his spirit dwells within you. Now if, if you are the temple and God lives inside of you. Does not God have a say-so in what you put in your body? If he doesn't want a dead, diseased pig in your body while he's in there, then that's, that's his choice. Let's take a look at the number one thing that caused all of humanity to be doomed was putting something in your mouth that you weren't supposed to put in your mouth. Something so simple, so easy to follow, and it doomed all of humanity. So here we are on YouTube, 6,000 years later, still mopping up that mess. Uh, let's see here. Stacy, Shalom, Stacy. Shalom. Uh, family unto the Lord, ready to escape. Brother Shane, what do you do on the Sabbath to start? 6 p.m. or ending at home or at church with your family. Okay. Well, typically, um, we will come together as a family. Now, we don't have to do this, but we choose to do it just as something fun to do, and the kids like it. We will have a thing of wine, and my wife usually cooks Shabbat bread, and we, we uh, I say the, the Hebrew blessing, uh, Baruch Atah, Yahuwah, Eloheinu Malachi Alam Hamotzi Lehem Imaretz, and I break the bread, and we eat it, and we give thanks to the Father. We um, then we drink the wine. We say the blessing for the wine. Uh, sometimes we will say the Shema uh, prayer in Hebrew, which is Shema Israel, Yehua Eloheinu Yehua Ahad Baruch Shem Kevot Mahuto Leolam Vayed Yahshua Hamashiach Hu Adunai. Now the that last part we added it I basically just said hero Israel Yahuwah our God Yahuwah is one um, blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity Yeshua you are the Messiah you are Lord once we say that we usually sing the Shabbat Shalom song and my kids we all Shabbat Shalom you know and the kids like it they just go crazy they love that song and so then after that uh, I usually get on team speak uh, well, I, after we eat our, our Sabbath meal and everything, we just kind of hang out and do whatever. Uh, and then the next day, I get on my TeamSpeak 3 server, and we do Shabbat on there. I have people from all over the world that come on there. We do Shabbat together. Sometimes I'll go down the road to uh, an assembly, a Shabbat assembly of uh, Hebrew roots people. And we'll do it like that. And then after the Shabbat... Uh, sometimes, not all the time, uh, we'll come together again as a family and we'll quote a psalm that says, From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of Yahuwah is to be praised. Thank you for the Sabbath day. And then we start cleaning the house because, you know, the kids done wreck the whole place. <laughs> we take care of the animals. Uh, I have sheep, chickens, and stuff like that, dogs, cats. You know, I mean, we do take care of them on the Sabbath because it's cruel not to feed or water animals, even if it's the Sabbath. So we do that, and and then we feed them again their supper, and then we feed the the kids their supper. And, you know, that's about all we do. But we relax on the Sabbath. We don't cook. We try to cook our meals the day before soup or something. That way, my wife's not in there slaving in the kitchen because. You know, I know that she's got kids and stuff to take care of, and but I want her to get her rest, her Sabbath rest. So, yeah, that's about what we do. Nothing special. Uh, Sabbath is from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. You are correct. That would be, actually, even Leviticus 23.32 says, You shall keep your Sabbath from sunset to sunset. Thank you, Stacy, 
Calder, Stacy Calder, why did this program start after the Sabbath ended? Well, that's because I was actually the Sabbath ended for me eight hours ago, and it's two fifteen in the morning. I was at uh, the Messianic Assembly today, and um, and then uh, I came back. I spoke with some people that are kind of having some issues in their life and tried to minister to them a little bit and then it took me a while to figure out how to use this YouTube thing so here we are after I figured it out needed some help I'm not that uh, <clears throat> I'm not that very knowledgeable of technology Okay, Thanksgiving, that's a good question, and I'm kind of torn on that because I've, I'm, there's a lot of misinformation, especially within the world of, me, of Messianics. Messianics, in my opinion, for some reason, they're looking more and more like Christians as to how much false information they just absorb like a sponge. When I was in, uh, this is like nine years ago, when I first started keeping Torah, and I was at a Messianic group in uh, Austin, Texas. Uh, I was taught by the teacher there that the Feast of Sukkot was Thanksgiving and that the pilgrims that came over to America were keeping the Sukkot celebration and they invited the Native Americans over to do the Feast of Sukkot. And that's what he told me. Uh, then everybody else said, oh, n no, this is some sort of pagan harvest festival or something it's a harvest festival and all harvest festivals are pagan i'm like <laughs> well hold them up because the feast of sukkot or the feast of tabernacles is a harvest festival according to scripture it's the fall harvest it's the third harvest and it's the most abundant harvest passover and the feast of unleavened bread are spring harvests and then pentecost is the summer harvest it's the the harvest of wheat just like first fruits right after Passover is the harvest of barley. And then you've got the fruit harvest in the summer. And if, if you know, to, I have not seen enough compelling evidence for me that suggests that um, Thanksgiving is pagan. I'm sure at some point, sometime in the world, some sometime in history, some pagan somewhere around the time of Thanksgiving did something pagan and this is a joke I say to people that I, I have you know the Torah terrorists that say oh you can't do that that's pagan you can't dance in a circle that's pagan you can't give Hanukkah presents on Hanukkah because you're just like a pagan pagans use toilet paper does that mean I need to switch to banana leaves I don't think so I'm sticking with my toilet paper I don't care what pagans do <laughs> you know, uh, I'm, I know where the fine line is as far as what is pagan and what is not pagan and keeping myself pure and coming together with your family, eating uh, a, a dead bird and saying thank you God for this or that and not really doing anything quote unquote pagan. I don't see any harm in that, you know, I just I don't see any harm in it. If I'm wrong, and uh, I take full responsibility if I'm wrong, but I have not seen any compelling evidence. I mean, I, there's people that say that Passover is pagan because the Greeks did some sort of wine harvest for some pagan wine god of the Greeks. And I'm like, well, good for them. I I'm doing what the scripture says, you know. So what? It's the spring harvest. Of course you're going to harvest grapes and you're going to make wine. I don't care what pagans do. I mean, most pagan cultures are going to associate their worship around harvest times. Just like the scripture does. I'm not saying the pagans are, are right for doing that, but I mean, it is what it is. I'm not going to stop giving thanks to the Father just because some pagan did something on the other side of the world 3,000 years ago. You know? Um. Uh, anyway, I hope that helps you out, Stacy. I hope it helps. Family ties, very nice. The 
family unto the Lord ready to escape. Amen. Well, um, yeah, I mean, we do Thanksgiving. I don't see any harm in Thanksgiving. It's not like we're bowing down to an Asherah tree decorated in balls or anything. You know, um, if anybody is planning on doing any Black Friday shopping, be careful because uh, that that stuff is just crazy. <laughs> Getting pepper sprayed and stuff in the Walmart. That's just absolute lunacy. Uh, if anybody else has any more questions uh, or, or about the topic or about the Sabbath or about um, New Moon, clean or unclean foods, what days are acceptable, any types of rebuttals, any types of comments, feel free to go ahead and comment and I'll try to answer it before it gets too late. Well, while I'm waiting, uh, we can go into ne uh, ne Nehemiah chapter 13. I was going to show you something else about the Sabbath. Or actually, no, I don't think it's 13. I think it was... I'll have to look that one up. There's some pretty good insight in the book of Nehemiah about the Sabbath. Nehemiah, it was Nehemiah 13, I was right. Okay, Nehemiah 13, and it came to be, this is verse 19 by the way, when, when, it, when it came to be, when the gates of Jerusalem were shaded before the Sabbath, that I commanded the doors to be shut and commanded that they should not be opened until after the Sabbath. And I stationed some of my servants at the gates so that no burdens would come to be brought in on the Sabbath day. Actually, you know what? Let's go back a few verses. We missed a few important things. Verse 15, it says, In those days I saw Jews... I No, I'm sorry... I'm reading the wrong translation here. In those days I saw Yehud... Wow, I cannot read this. Let's switch translations. In those days I saw in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and laying and, lay, and putting burdens on donkeys as also wine, grapes, and figs and all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in that day, wherein they sold their goods. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold them on the Sabbath day to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with them, with the nobles of Judah, and said to them, What evil thing is this that you do, and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers... Did not your fathers thus, and did not God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet you bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. All right, pause. They're putting burdens on animals on the Sabbath day. That's forbidden according to Scripture. And it doesn't necessarily say in the Torah that it's forbidden to sell goods on the Sabbath. But for some reason, ne Nehemiah here thinks that it is wrong to sell things on the Sabbath. Um, so it says, And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants set I at the gates, that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and the sellers of all kind of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice then I testified against them and I said unto them why lodge you about the wall if you do so again I will lay hands on you from that time forward they did not come in on the Sabbath day 
And when it says, if you do so again, I will lay hands on you. He's not talking about prayer. He's talking about beating the snot out of them. So we see here that there's a little bit of commentary, I think, in Scripture about what is a permissible what is permissible on the Sabbath day. And according to Nehemiah, um, clearly animals carrying burdens and also merchants trying to sell uh, merchandise on the Sabbath, he forbid them from coming into the city to sell. He didn't want them, I guess he didn't want any buying or selling going on on, on the Sabbath. Uh, now, technically, uh, these merchants, this is their occupation. This is what they do for a living. So clearly they are sinning by trying to work on the Sabbath doing their occupation, which is selling clothing or figs or whatever they're doing. So yeah, that might bring a curse, and that's why they got kicked out of the land in the first place, was because they didn't let the land rest for 490 years, and God vomited them out of the land, or no, God made the land vomit them out, and he gave the land its rest. Every seven years, the land gets its rest. On the seventh year, it rests. They didn't let it rest for 490 years. 490 years divided by 7 equals 70 so they went to Babylonian captivity for 70 years because of their lackadaisy approach at the Sabbath including the sabbatical year Sabbath for the land so I don't think Nehemiah is taking any chances here with anybody buying or selling or doing anything like that on the Sabbath okay here's a great question Stacy Calder how do we know when the new moon is? Very good question. And for 10 years, I have tried to figure that out. And just recently, I believe I have figured out the answer. The Sabbath is... I'm sorry, not the Sabbath. Uh, the new moon, it boils down to basically two things. Some people keep the new moon celebration at conjunction, which is when the moon is black which is when uh, the moon goes into its phase where it passes in front of the sun, not in a solar eclipse, but just passes in front of the sun to where you can't see it in the day or at the night. It's black. Like, you cannot see nothing. Typically, the next day or the next or the day after that, the moon will be so far to the left of the sun, depending on if you're in the north or south or southern hemisphere, and you will see a crescent, uh, like a, a thumbnail of the moon. <clears throat> and a lot of people say that's when the new moon is. So I started out my walk uh, keeping crescent new moon because that's what I was taught. And then some people came along and said, no, I don't think so. And they showed me a bunch of stuff and I said, okay. I fought it, I fought it, I said, well, you know, it makes sense what they're saying. And then I kind of came up with some more stuff to add to their doctrine about how the conjunction moon is technically the real deal. And then I was confronted by another man who, I guess, he set out on a, a hardcore mission to prove that it was at Crescent, and he definitely persuaded me he pulled up from the Mishnah and the Talmud which by the way I don't really follow the Talmud I don't follow the Mishnah I just I'm a scripturalist I just follow scripture I don't chase after traditions of men that's what a lot of the uh, Talmud is it's just basically the oral tradition of the Pharisees and in all of the the Rabbi Akiva and all all the traditions put down on paper. There's 13 volumes of it, I think, thousands of pages written by thousands of different people. Um, the um, in the in the Talmud, there are several indications, and I'm strictly looking at the Talmud as. A historical reference for trying to determine when the new moon is and there are several people in the Talmud that specifically state that there must be two witnesses to 
to say that they saw the new moon, that they saw it. And in the Talmud, they talk about punishments for people who lie and claim they saw it and didn't really see it. And they talk about all sorts of arguments and things. Um, you know what? I got it right here. <laughs> I still have this teaching. Okay. And the most important thing is that, and, and there's a lot of people out there that don't like the Talmud and they don't like the Mishnah and they say that's bad, that's, that's Phariseeism or whatever. O okay, fine. Well, there's still another reference that has nothing to do with that and it's from a guy named Philo. Philo was a Jew that was born in Alexandria, Egypt during the time of, um, of the Messiah. He was alive during the time of the Messiah. I don't think he ever moved out of Egypt, though. His name was Philo. He was a philosopher. In fact, he was such a great philosopher. That is where we get the word philosophy from, was from that man, Philo. Now, Sophie is the study of something. And this is Philo Sophie, or the study of Philo, and his master way of arguing things and, and being very mathematically you know, just genius and, and poetically genius and everything. So, I was going to quote Philo and I was going to quote the, um, the ancient historical references that I have. Concerning the new moon. Um, you can find a guide for the Torah portion simply by typing in today's Torah portion in a Google search or this Sabbath's Torah portion or today's Torah portion. That's what what we normally do. Or, or you could buy a calendar that has all the portions and like a, a biblical Hebrew calendar. Michael Root has a cool calendar. Uh, there's a guy that uh, Mr. Messer, he calls himself Rabbi Messer. He's got a really good calendar, and they have the portions outlined on each Sabbath day. <clears throat> but I just I just usually Google it, you know, when we read it. So. Bear with me. I'm I'm just trying to find uh, the information about in the uh, okay. Here we go. Philo. Here's the reference in his treatise on the special laws, Book Two, Chapter Eleven, Verse or Verse Forty One. Philo discusses the biblical observances. Note below that he describes the new moon, but let's make this clear. He was someone that was the contemporary of Yeshua, living at the same time as Yeshua. So, Messianics cannot say that, oh, the Jews changed it when they came up with the rabbinical system, or when they wrote the Talmud. The Talmud was written like a couple hundred years after Yeshua died. So you can't use that excuse. That's why I think Philo is, has the best uh, argument for Crescent. And I never knew this before until I was just shown this this year and I changed my entire, uh, the entire way that I keep feast days now because they're determined by the new moon. Um, I'll just continue reading this. It says, but let's make this clear. He was someone that was below, um, I'm sorry. No, nope, I'm messing up. I'm messing up. My brain is shutting down, folks. <clears throat> okay, I'm just going to quote what Philo says. It is that which comes after the conjunction, which is the day of the new moon, in which month, in his detailed discussion of the new moon, Philo describes what constitutes a new moon. 
at the time of the new moon, the sun begins to illuminate the moon with a light which is visible to the outward senses, and then she displays her own beauty to the beholders. That is a quote from Philo. The sun begins to illuminate the moon with a light which is visible to the outward senses, and then she displays her own beauty to the beholders. What he said before that was, it is that which comes after the conjunction, which is the day of the new moon. After conjunction is when you get the crescent. As Philo noted, the new moon follows the conjunction, but it is not the conjunction itself. His observation reveals to us what was considered the new moon in Yeshua's day and what the Savior himself also observed as the new moon. That is all we need to know to realize what still constitutes a biblical new moon today. Now, there are several Tal Talmud writings about the new moon and several different arguments about uh, witnesses and where they should be positioned and how they should look and and uh, Gamaliel even had a chart of different of picture not pictures but like drawings of the new moon and he would ask the uh, the witnesses what do you see like what did it look like and they would point and only he knew which one really looked like the new moon to see if you know if they were telling the truth because I guess at some point somewhere in the Talmud it was recorded that some people tried to deceive uh, the Sanhedrin and claim that there was a new moon when there really wasn't one and so there's a whole freaking chapter written about that and it's all in the Talmud and it's something real simple and here's just a tool that you can use that I use to verify this information is that I found the Talmud online and I simply went to uh, you know each book and I hit on my keyboard if you have a computer you hit control um, control G if you hit control G a little thing pops up in the top right of your screen just type in new moon or type in moon and a bunch of stuff will pop up and more than likely it's going to be talking about the new moon um, what is the difference between the weekly sabbath and the high sabbath a high sabbath there's only seven high sabbaths in a year so a high sabbath is could fall on any day of the week and it is determined um, by the new moon and not just a weekly counting cycle now I want to make it clear that before God even created the Sun the moon and the stars which is on day four he was already counting the days so he established a week before there was even a Sun or a moon so the seven day week cycle remains separate from the lunar days of the month um, the first month on the 14th day of the month is the Passover now it's the 14th you kill the Passover on the 14th and um, as the day goes into the 15th day of the month you eat the Passover and <clears throat> that is a high Sabbath the 15th of the month is a high Sabbath because it's the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread that day can fall on any day um, there a um, then of course the seventh day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a high Sabbath then um, Pentecost or Shavuot in the Hebrew is a high Sabbath and then you have um, Yom Teruah or the Feast of Trumpets it's a high Sabbath and it's always the first day of the month of the seventh uh, month on the Hebrew calendar and it's always a new moon and that is a high Sabbath that's the only real day that uh, the new moon is a high Sabbath is on the Feast of Trumpets and then you have the Day of Atonement which is 10 days later in the 10th day of the seventh month then you have in the 15th day of the seventh month is another high Sabbath and that starts the Feast of uh, Tabernacles or Sukkot in the Hebrew and then on the eighth day you there is a uh, high Sabbath of that feast so the difference between the high Sabbath and a weekly Sabbath is that a high Sabbath is for a Moadim 
or which is the the feast days and then just the regular old weekly sabbath which never ends it just c continues on every week of the year you know oh I, I hope that answers your question stacy and uh and i don't know if you were here at the beginning of the video but we actually covered that that uh yeshua the reason that they were trying to get his body off of the cross was because it was almost about to be the high sabbath not the weekly sabbath because i can even use my astronomy software and go back to that year and see when the new moon was and and what it correlates to to the uh, gregorian uh calendar now i i i don't i don't like the gregorian calendar don't get me wrong but every single nation from the beginning of time until now at any point in history no matter where you lived even including countries that did not have Jewish or Catholic influence have all kept the seventh day as the seventh day forever it does not matter where you go what culture what millennium what century the seventh day has always remained the seventh day all throughout the world regardless of catholic or jewish influence there's a lot of people that say conspiracy they changed the sabbath it's not really on Saturday. And then they they try to uh they try to tap into your emotions and and tap into your catholic hate or whatever and say well it's the catholics they did it you know shame on them and they try to get you all riled up you know i don't base my belief on conspiracy theory I, I base it all, I try to base it all on fact now when I don't have a fact I take the balance scales of truth and I weigh them w which one seems to have more credence you know in the new moon was one of those times when I had to use the balance scales I said well because I didn't know about all this stuff in the Talmud and the Mishnah and, and Philo's writings so I just had to take information and put it in the scales and if it tipped to this side I I did that if it tipped to this side I did that I can't stand against my own uh, conscience so I had to do what I thought was right and right now I would say <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm right about about the new moon considering there's three historical references Mishnah Talmud and Philo's writings that all indicate that the new moon was um, at the crescent are not the high sabbaths occur in the fall uh, they do most of them do but there are two that occur in the spring one in the summer and four in the fall well yeah I mean they did what what they said in the cat and I know what you're talking about they're claiming that they changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. That's what they say. They say that there's nowhere in the scripture that says that it changed. They say that they changed it. They even admit that. Now, the Sabbath, the true Sabbath, which is the Sabbath according to Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 through 11 and uh, Exodus 31 that's never going to change the seventh day will always be the seventh day and uh here's a here's a question for you guys try to answer and i'll give you a minute to type do you know why god says that we need to keep the sabbath what is his reason for giving us the sabbath he he actually gives a reason in scripture that we are to keep the Sabbath. Like, why do we keep it? He gives a reason. Does anybody know? <laughs> I should start like a, a Bible trivia thing on here. It would be so much fun. I'm, I'm sure people would, would love to do that. Whoever answers first gets a, a internet cookie. <laughs> Uh, I'm pulling up I'm pulling up the scripture on why why does God say for us to keep the Sabbath what is the purpose that God gave us the Sabbath let me see what your answers are 
Well, he, he commanded us to keep the Sabbath, to rest on the Sabbath. That, that's what, I mean, yes, that's a, that's a no-brainer, of course. He commanded us to rest on the Sabbath. But, I mean, you, we, that's a fair assumption to say that, yes, we were, that's the only reason. But there's a more important reason, the most important reason, and God says what that most important reason is in Exodus chapter 31, verse 13. It says, And you speak to the children of Israel, saying, My Sabbaths you are to guard by all means, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, so that you know that I, Yahuwah, am setting you apart. That is the key, and that is why God wants us to keep the Sabbath. Because he, he says why right here. So that you know... That it is I, Yahuwah, who am setting you apart. If you don't keep the Sabbath, we won't know that it is Yahuwah who is setting us apart. That's from God's own mouth, so I can't argue with it, you know. Right. Yeah, he, he he hollowed the day. He sanctified the day because he finished his work in six days and rested the seventh day. He set it apart. Then he commanded people to rest on the day. But the reason he wants us to rest on the day is so that we know that it is him who sanctifies us. It's kind of a trick question, but I thought it was kind of cool. That there is, there's like a, an actual reason that he wants us to keep it. And not just because he says so. He gives us a good reason to keep it. So that we know it is him who sanctifies us. Or sets us apart. <clears throat> well folks, uh, it's been great on here sharing with you guys. Uh, like I said... Um, I have a video on my channel. It's about the team speak. If you guys were ever interested in coming to the team speak, um, we get in there on Shabbat at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time, and um, some we don't have really enough. I mean, at, at most we might have six or seven people in there, but uh, you guys are welcome to come. And there's a video that shows you how to download Team Speak in my videos on my channel. Stacy Calder says, some people say that those that keep Sunday have the mark of the beast. What do you think? I, I've heard that. I've definitely heard that. There, there are many different ways you can look at that. For instance, in... Um, Deuteronomy chapter 6 when speaking about the Shema prayer the real Shema prayer not the traditional one that I said earlier in Hebrew but the real one is uh, Hear O Israel Yahuwah our God Yahuwah is one and you shall love Yahuwah your Elohim with all your heart with all your soul and with all your might and these words that I command you today shall be in your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your children you shall speak of them when you sit at home when you walk by the way when you rise up when you lie down and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be for frontlets between your eyes, and you shall post them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. Now notice he's saying that you gotta post the com you gotta bind them as a sign on your hand, the commandments. These words Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah our God, Yahuwah is one, and you shall love Yahuwah your Elohim with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. Those are the words that we bind to our hands and to our forehead. Now the enemy has come along and he has a replacement. Whatever that replacement is, it's, it's the opposite of God's commandments on our right hand or on our forehead. Now, if you look at um, 666 in the Greek language, 
and you compare that to um, terrorists today what they will do is before a suicide bomber puts a bomb on their chest they do the ceremony where they will bind a name uh, it says in the name of Allah on their right hand and they'll wear a green bandana with the symbols that mean in the name of Allah now if you look at those symbols in Arabic and you look at the Greek number for 666 they're identical which is crazy but it's true because I looked it up uh, you can, if you get on Google right now to images and type in um, 666 and Allah, the, the God Allah, you will see the Greek number for 666 and you will see the Arabic name for Allah and they're identical. And it's, uh, I can't believe it, but it's true. <laughs> so as far as people go into church on Sunday and they're saying this is the mark of the beast well uh, I don't know it's a stretch for me it's a big stretch now I understand that there you know there could be some truth to this whole doctrine that the Catholic Church is the beast system and you know they you know they you know I get it I get it but at the same time how how are people not going to be able to buy or sell without this mark um, you know that's a good question I mean blue laws are not they're not that prevalent you know and they're not even th that great I mean so what you can't buy alcohol on Sundays you know I can buy alcohol after 12 o'clock on Sundays if I wanted to so it's not like you really can't buy or sell anything without this mark or the number of his name here's another thing is that the person has to receive the mark you have to be willing to take it it's not forced on anybody now, if this is talking about allegorical or or if it's all just symbolism or if it's a literal mark that they're going to put in or on your right hand or in or on your forehead, I don't know. I guess we'll just wait and see. All I know is they better bring the SWAT team to my house if anybody tries to put anything in my right hand or in my forehead because I'm not having that. But um, just me personally, I, you know sometimes even in my Torah walk now I would go to a Sunday church just for the sole purpose of finding real brothers and sisters that are in that dying tradition and trying to pull them out of the burning building and I was successful in doing that um, so I don't think like I received any type of mark in my right hand or in my forehead now people say that you know well, if you have the commandments in, in your on your right hand or on your forehead, you're not going to do the enemy's laws. And that's understandable. But at the same time, you know, I think God gives us some freedom to choose where we're going to go on what day. And I don't think walking into a church on Sunday is going to mean I'm going to go to hell forever. You know, I, I, I can't see that. But that's just me. Maybe you're right, Stacy. Maybe it is all just going to church on Sunday but I can't see it you know I don't know but yeah if you look up uh, in the name of Allah in the Greek numbers for 666 they look identical you know the book of Revelation is written in mystery for, on purpose Satan also reads the book of Revelation you know it's written in mystery on purpose and I fear that a lot of the book of Revelation you won't even really understand until after it's already happened many prophecies are like that shrouded in mystery and a lot of revelation is you don't know if it's a vision or if it's physical or if it's just speaking spiritually or, or what's going on it's it's a very hard to understand book just recently I was reading uh, Revelation 14 and I discovered that um, what is being described is what I believe to be astronomical signs it says and I saw a messenger flying in mid heaven with the everlasting gospel well, mid heaven is in between the three heavens we got the, the firmament which is the first heaven it's where the birds fly we got outer space which is the second heaven which is where the star the sun and the moon is we got the third heaven, which is where heaven is and where 
the Father is. This angel was flying in mid-heaven, and he had a message, and he was called a messenger. The mark can also be an implant, implant like they did in Wisconsin. It's very possible, Stacy. That's why I said, if anybody's going to give me a mark, they got to bring the SWAT team. <laughs> Because I'm not, I'm not having no foreign thing in my body. Here's another thing that a lot of, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I jump back and forth. And I, I don't claim to know everything. And I don't really claim to know exactly what the mark of the beast is either. But RFID technology, it has a detrimental effect on your health. Especially if you're around electromagnetic field radiation. When you have a... a a device in your body that is constantly receiving EMF or electromagnetic field it'll cause sores to break out or a, a large sore to pop up on your skin if, if the uh, the EMF is too high and I found it, find it interesting in the book of Revelation that it says that those that received the mark rec they ha they received a loathsome sore on their body I find that very interesting. I mean, essentially, your body wants to reject this foreign device. You know, especially if it's a giant magnet for EMF. You know, that that very well could be some sort of implantable device. I don't know for sure. But I know that nothing but the commandments of God are going to be bound to my right hand or forehead in in any event and I'm also going to try to keep the commandments so I'd have to say you know e either way I think I'm safe but it's not just receiving the mark in the right hand or in the forehead it's also worshiping the beast and his image which is a part that people forget about they think it's all about the mark of the beast it's also about worshiping hi him or worshiping the beast and his image so just just don't do that. And don't no marks, no worshiping images, no beast worship, and we should be good. Those that endure to the end will be saved. And then we got Revelations 14 verse 12. This is the patience of the saints. Here are those that hear the commandments of God and hold their faith in Yeshua the Messiah. Or yeah, in the gospel of Yeshua. So, yep. <clears throat> well, folks, uh, it's 3 a.m., and I think I got to get going. So, thank you very much for joining me. Like I said, join us on TeamSpeak. And if you'd like, uh, I'll try to get back on here from time to time and bring up different discussions and things. Um, if, you, if you guys ever come in the TeamSpeak, we can all talk together instead of me just reading comments. But whatever's comfortable with you guys I'm just here to help I'm not looking for any kind of glory or following uh, so yeah thank you Stacy thank you family ties thank you everybody I love you Shalom and have a good one <laughs>